I shall now hand over for the keynote address to Lord Toby Harris. Uh, Lord, Lord Harris, the, um, the, the webinar floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. If you go back to the early weeks of 2020, when reports of a flu-like illness in Wuhan were first reported by the World Health Organization, few would have anticipated the scale of what was about to unfold. Certainly the speed with which the norms of society unraveled with deserted city centers, businesses shut down, enforced social distancing and mask wearing, all of that came as a shock to many. However, we should have been ready. Epidemics have occurred traumatically throughout history and pandemic flu has been in the top tier of the UK's National Risk Register since it was first published a decade ago. So far, 2022, has brought us the war in Ukraine, a world energy crisis, near double digit inflation, and we're only just into April. The National Preparedness Commission, which I chair, was conceived before COVID hit, but the last two years have highlighted how vital its central purpose to promote better preparedness in the UK for a major crisis or incident has become. At that first meeting 16 months ago, commissioners were warned that irrespective of COVID, we are living in a world that is increasingly volatile and unstable. Indeed, a month later, a new edition of the National Risk Register was published, mapping, as you know, 38 major risks facing the country, including environmental hazards, major accidents, malicious attacks, both cyber-based and terrorist, risks arising overseas, and inevitably, animal and human diseases. So the Commission I chair has in essence therefore to focus on three questions. What should we prepare for? How much preparedness is enough? And how do we finance the necessary investment? And these are not just questions for national government. There is a welcome recognition of this in last year's integrated review. Now, most of the public discussion of that review focused on the defense and foreign policy content which incidentally is now looking a bit out of date. But the review also explicitly promised a comprehensive national resilience strategy. You might be uh, surprised to discover that we didn't have one already. Uh, and that national resilience strategy is to be based on a whole of society approach involving individuals, businesses, and organizations. Making every level of government, every organization, and every community more resilient can create a sort of herd immunity for a society better able to address future global crises, whether it's a new pandemic or a massive cyber attack or climate change or whatever. And there are, of course, a series of global trends that are likely to impact directly or indirectly on all of us in the coming years. First and foremost, climate change, leading to more and more frequent extreme weather events both at home and abroad. Floods, drought, storms, heat waves, heavy rainfall becoming more intense and more frequent. Some parts of the world will become increasingly uninhabitable, driving huge movements of refugees and leading to shortages of water uh, and food with an impact on global supply chains and producing political instability that will inevitably spill over national borders. Second, the world can expect increased competition for natural resources, notably rare earth minerals, but we're currently wrestling with issues around grain. With, and that will produce greater supply insecurities. And all of this is happening in the context of a changing world order and rapid geopolitical change. The US surrendering its preeminence, China becoming an increasingly dominant economic power, Russia using kinetic and hybrid means to maximize its influence. And at the same time, the future of the European Union perhaps is becoming less certain. And just over a year ago, we had the Texas power failure. Now that was an illustration of vulnerability in a modern, highly industrialized nation. It highlighted the failure to invest adequately in the maintenance of critical infrastructure, the reliance on ever more complex and interconnected systems, and the dangers of cascade collapse. Such vulnerabilities exist around the globe. And as in Texas, no one entity is responsible for mitigating them. 
So some crises will arise suddenly and unexpectedly, requiring urgent action. Others will develop over decades. But one thing we should learn from the last two years is that we cannot go on burying our heads in the sand. We need to be better prepared for the unexpected. The overriding lesson in every country is that we have not been investing sufficiently in our preparedness and resilience. In essence, we have to try and predict the unpredictable. We have to prepare for the uncertain and recognize that some of it will be wrong. And what makes that all the more difficult is that our minds, and that includes our politicians, regulators and officials, tend to be programmed in ways that make it hard to respond to novel risks and to protracted and complex challenges. We find it easier to believe that something might happen if it comes easily to mind. The harder it is to picture, the less is our intuitive estimate of its likelihood. Then there is optimism bias, predisposing us to be over-optimistic about the risk of something bad happening and overconfident about our ability to cope if it does. And at worst, this can result in outright denial. And of course, it's really, really hard to form sound judgments about how much effort to invest in preventing low likelihood, but very high impact risks. And we're also subject to confirmation bias, that universal tendency to pay attention to what supports our existing beliefs. And groupthink, the inclination to follow the pack and conform to the majority view. And finally, there is a nimpto, not in my term of office. Being properly prepared and resilient is expensive. Adopting a preparedness philosophy means parking our just-in-time approach in favour of just-in-case. And that means being ready to build in redundancy and to avoid interdependence. Now, I am a recovering politician. So I know how difficult it is for our elected leaders to devote resources, by which I mean the public's tax contributions, to projects that do not come to fruition by the time of the next election, let alone the one after it, or build resilience that is probably invisible and may never be needed for an eventuality that may not happen. And what's more, it's usually impossible to prove that your actions have prevented something happening, particularly if that hypothetical event is at some indeterminate time in the future and almost certainly long after your term of office is forgotten. And that's why Mayor Kotoku Wamura of Fudai in Japan is such a rare exception. He served as mayor for 40 years, re-elected nine times, quite an achievement. But in the 1970s, he was ridiculed for insisting on building a 51 foot high floodgates and a huge 673 foot seawall at a cost of $30 million. He was vindicated by the tsunami of 2011 that obliterated other nearby towns, but not Fudai. 3,000 residents owed their lives to his foresight, but he was by then long dead, and his only thanks were the many flowers laid on his grave. So to be resilient and prepared, we need to scan the horizon. What is out there, but not yet looming? Elijah's cloud, if you like, no bigger than a man's hand. And we've got to look out for Rumsfield's unknown unknowns. We've got to get beyond simply admiring the scale of what we face, whether it's climate change, a pandemic even more serious than COVID, a devastating cyber attack, or whatever else it might be. And often the responses needed are threat neutral. The steps necessary are the same, whatever the hazard. It is, of course, a truism that generals always prepare to fight the last war rather than the one that is actually coming. So David Oman, the former UK security co coordinator, recasts it in a slightly different way. He said, what we prepare for, we deter. So what we actually experience by way of events is alas, what we have not prepared for. The reality is that our nations, our cities and communities and our organizations have to have preparedness and resilience designed in. It has to be part of society's fabric. Of course, it's not cost free but not doing it is worse. Or as John F. Kennedy put it, there are risks and costs to action, but they are far less than the long range costs of comfortable inaction. Thank you.
Lord Harris, thank you very, thank you very much. Some uh, superb themes there for teeing up the re the rest of the session, uh, and you. Uh, remind us at the end of I think, and you said you're a recovering politician, but you remind us at the end of the, the the great difficulty there in getting people to pay for something when they can't see can't see the immediate benefit of uh, uh, of it. Um, and yes, there are, as you quite rightly said, there are costs of inaction. Um, but until uh, the 9/11 moment has happened, people find it very difficult to take it seriously. And I wonder, therefore, whether this um, business in Ukraine at the moment, this dreadful war in Ukraine, and the fact that a British government for the first time um, that I can remember since 62 has had to seriously consider its policy decisions in the light of um, a possible nuclear exchange. And if that doesn't concentrate minds, um, that uh, we, we should really be thinking beyond our post-89 rather cosy moment, then I can't think of anything else that is more frightening or serious uh, than that. Um, and therefore, it's been a wonderful um, opening pitch uh, from you that has, I think, really uh, got us into um, the essential seriousness of what we're talking about. So thank you uh, very, very much uh, indeed. Um, I shall uh, maintain the floor here, and I hope to build on that, because uh, there's a whole load of things that I would have said but you have teed it up brilliantly in your in your intro speech so I just wanted to just take a few minutes uh, to maybe talk about some of the practicalities um, and so mine is going to be uh, a little bit more perhaps about machinery of government than it is about um, resilience per se because you have teed up um, what that is all about and, and, and the question very much today is can we achieve it? Is, is government up to it? So the first thing says, is it achievable before one would launch off on uh, you know, considerations of why things are, are difficult? So let's be very positive and let's say, actually, uh, the history of UK government when crises hit, uh, referring immediately um, back to Lord Harris's point that that's when crises hit, the British government tends to be quite good um, at responding and you've reminded us you've got to do this before there's a crisis and before there is a, um, uh, a very obvious clear and present danger or something that has to be dealt with. So when it comes to wartime we're actually quite good as a nation at generating committees of people who can uh, move the dials quite quickly and make things happen and we have an example of that recently and it is indeed in that question of resilience in this case health resilience and in this case um, in the government's own number one risk which was a pandemic and yet in dealing with it I think uh, we we probably I'm assuming most of us might agree that one of the best um, elements of our uh, response mechanism was an ad hoc committee the Vas vaccine task force that was formed to work around uh, our normal structures and our normal ways of doing business. Uh, and it pulled in, as good wartime committees do, um, people with experience from the, the private and the public sector. And the people who are most valuable are those who have a foot in both camps. And I think that's a, a, a very important uh, point here when we look at building resilience, is to ask ourselves to what extent we have structures that allow people to have a foot in both camps so that they can navigate that seam when push comes to shove. My own experience in this, I have to say, uh, is rather mixed. Having tried to pull together teams uh, under the reserve system, and many of you will know, and those who read the FT might have, uh, if you didn't know, have read a story in the last couple of months about essentially the economic warfare team we put in now. That team has done some very good work um, and uh, fed the PM's red box over the weekend with a few elements looking at our economic resilience, which has led to the, um, the, the recent legislation on, if you like, national economic uh, infrastructure. And that's very much in, 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 in the news today. But establishing it has been extremely painful extremely painful because there wasn't a process, a word I'm going to come back to, by which you could pull these uh, current or recent ex-bankers in and make them captains and majors or squadron leaders in the services and allow them to carry on doing what they're doing. Um, 
ridiculously, we could recruit them as soldiers and pay for these people to drive around places that we've been in recently, such as Iraq and Afghanistan, as uh, soldiers on a snatch Land Rover. But to pay them to do what they're very good at in the service of the state has been difficult. And I don't think that is just me, because while trying to pull something together for Ukraine at the moment, war crimes and using OSIN better, a colleague recently of GCHQ was telling me of the difficulty he had uh, in getting some of his team into a reserve structure, even though there are seniors in, uh, in, in the MOD trying to use them right now. So I think we do have we do have some structural problems there, even though across our society, we don't have legal barriers, that some other nations to do. And I think we have a, a cultural ability to pull together, as I say, when push comes to shove. Where are those frictions then and how might uh, they uh, uh, arise? Well, I would argue that um, the body that really wants to be thinking about uh, resilience is the National Security Council. Um, and if it, if it means anything, then it shouldn't just be a crisis response organization. It should be the area where we look at a whole bunch of strategies, not least at the moment, I would suggest energy security. And I don't know, I don't need to make that case uh, anymore, given what's going on in, in Ukraine. Uh, and the fact that um, the EU uh, is sending, has sent since the start of the conflict, 35 billion to Russia and only 1 billion to, to, to Ukraine. We can all see why energy security is a key part of national security. But that's the organisation that really should be thinking about resilience, making sure that we are we are set up to do it. And then below that and below the National Security Advisor, you would need a national security staff. And I would argue they are not big enough at the moment to really start doing the staff work to pull all this together. They're essentially a secretariat that prepares for the meetings. And ditto the Cabinet Office, even though in the Civilian Contingency Secretariat, it's got a very good team yeah, and some very good people. But I would argue they are set up um, to be responsive. They're set up still to deal with crises. They're not set up to be proactive and therefore to think through how we would build, uh, as, as Lord Harris said, how we would build resilience into our systems from, uh, from the word go. And to that end, I think the, the culture, I would suggest, in Whitehall needs to change. And I know there are several groups um, who are working at the moment to try and help the cabinet sector with this. I happen to be involved uh, in, in one that's trying to put the idea of more of a future tense into the way that Whitehall and certainly the centre of government thinks to uh, pull together all the government departments. Once again, when there's a clear and present danger, we demonstrate we can do it very well. And I would argue that the OSCT, um, the Office of Security and Counterterrorism in the Home Office, has actually worked extremely well over the last couple of years in pulling together all the government departments, even onto raw data sharing. So we are digitally connected, which is very much something we need to be thinking about um, in this age. But it is a it may be a persistent problem, but of course there's an immediacy to counter terrorism and a political will there uh, that made it happen. I would argue not so much uh, around the rest of government. So OSCT in the Home Office is working well, but turn your telly on today and you'll find people talking Brits talking about trying to get Ukrainians over here and dealing with the bureaucracy of the Home Office. We have the Oakenden report on the National Health Service where lessons just are not learned. We've got what happened with the post office which really only surfaced last year and any number of uh, MOD procurement problems. So I think we have a cultural history here also with the absent that clear and present danger we do have quite um, sclerotic processes within a series of fiefdoms within the various uh, government departments. Um, and certainly I, I do remember working once again with industry to try and put a knowledge platform together at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and in the initial uh, buzz of interest, um, we, we did it literally overnight with four companies who'd never worked together. That sort of is not a pace that Whitehall works at. Uh, and I was asked to get it in because a decision would be made on Thursday. Seven weeks later to the day, the Tuesday, I was told a decision will be made on Thursday. To my knowledge, a uh, decision was uh, never made. But by that stage, about 28 government departments, chief scientific advisors, had all said they had to have a say. And so you ended up with paralysis uh, by uh, uh, analysis. So if we actually had a process for building resilience, then we might 
we might get somewhere with it because but at the moment i'm afraid i see most of the government departments as being stovepiped of looking after quite narrow interests and essentially becoming harbors and keepers of process more concerned i would suggest with managing inputs than with achieving uh, outputs and as we said if the national security uh, council doesn't own this output then how is it going to really drive any of the particular government departments and I see mark has tuned in and mark has a much better view of the home office than me he might be able to come back with some thoughts on that uh, later on um before i sum up the final thought i had on all that as well is um you're going to have to spend some money here and you're going to have to work across the public and private sector um, and I will argue in the digital age for resilience and what have you, just as with the OSCT, you are going to have to be buying a lot of software capabilities. All those things are very difficult to do at the moment with government contracting rules. So I think this is another area where we need to look um, at the way uh, gov government procurement works, or I think the problems we've got in trying to find a route to finance, which is pennies, people into the reserve structure is going to be... Um, many, many times greater than that if we try to build something that, for example, Sweden or Finland has, which is uh, a properly resili resilient public private sector that works together, exercises, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and has built those structures in peacetime um, and at some cost. So um, I think to sum all that up, um, uh, I would I would say this is going to be very difficult to do because the current cultures and processes uh, mitigate against it. My conclusion, therefore, is it's going to have to be very strongly politically led uh, in the way that something like the vaccine task force was politically led. Uh, and if the whole business of nuclear weapons uh, being threatened to be used um, hasn't got people's minds concentrated on the moment on thinking the unthinkable, then um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what will. And I think that's my um, uh, seven to ten minutes up so um, I shall stop there and um, not uh, bother to thank myself uh, but I would just tee up I'm trying to see whether Simon is Simon I've got you there um, I've got you there uh, in the middle um, Simon is the director of Joint Support UK Strategic Command, which if there is a command that is thinking through its uh, abilities to pull some of these capacities together and to uh, work across government, then it is uh, HQ Strategic Command. So Simon, very much looking forward to see uh, what, uh, what you have to tell us. The floor is yours. Um, and to, to, to colleagues online, um, thank you. Um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to um, contextualise a little bit of what I'm Day. Um, I'm going to draw threads from uh, what Lord Harris had to say right from the outset, but um, I also want to talk to some of the positives because there are some um, there are some solutions that that are now manifest. I think to some of the challenges that um, that you've heard both the previous speakers talk to, but um, I'm sure you'll be the judge of how effective you think they'll be after I've unpacked it. Um, so my theme is around supply chains and supply chain resilience. That, that is my area of expertise. I'm a 32 year serving logistician um, uh, in the army and in and, and the joint space of defense. So as Lord, ha Lord Harris um, uh, intimates, we've had more than two years of unprecedented levels of interest in, on, on matters of global supply chain and their resilience. Conversations back then were about Brexit and EUTP which continues to draw media and public awareness uh, onto the realities of supply and demand. Uh, and then there was COVID-19, of course, and that pandemic, and it's continued globally on trade routes and the flow of goods. Single event issues, uh, and you'll remember, of course, the ever stuck in the sewer now that still resonate, as do the criticality of container shortages in the world market. But we now have, of course, Russia's unjustified uh, invasion of Ukraine and the realisation of what war in Europe is global market. And as most on this will know, Belarus uh, and Russia, of course, are key exporters of energy, commodities and raw materials, some of which are essential to the production of semiconductor chips, catalytic converters, uh, electronic car batteries, etc. And the interruption of supply has therefore brought uh, uh, impact on the manufacturing of car parts and devices such as laptops, smartphones, and in military parlance, uh, complex munitions by way of example. Shipping routes, 
uh, may add further disruption and large organisations are expected to attempt to forward buy and hold additional stocks uh, for a period to reduce any short-term impact. So the just-in-case analogy being applied. Um, this is expected to heighten pressure on all sectors and buyers already exposed to supply constraints and inflationary pressures will fill that pain. Uh, and moreover, the impact on energy prices, of course, as we all know, impact us all, but particularly and as we know, the fear and reality of the disruption of global supply chains is raising commodity prices uh, and global inflation, as we heard, is expected to rise further, um, possibly into those uh, double digit figures, outstripping certainly any wage increase contractor and contracting consumer spending power. So with that as the backdrop, what are the impacts of the defence? Well, we are well and truly awakening to the realisation that resilience matters and indeed, almost certainly costs. As we consider what the new normal means in practice, the MOD is recognizing that simple cost versus product dynamic, which creates overly brittle supply chain solutions, it is the right thing going forward. Sorry, we are questioning whether that is the right thing going forward. Um, um, for if this crisis and those that precede them have shown us anything, it must surely point to the importance of end-to-end -end value chain planning and supply chain integration as both force multiple and affording competitive advantage. The US certainly sees it that way, um, following the US presidential executive order and the study that the US Department of Defense has just published entitled Securing Defense Critical Supply Chains. It's an action plan, it's available online, it was published on the 24th of February. And it's a call to action, which outlines several immediate actions to address vulnerabilities and strengthen resilience with the launch of a new task force aimed at addressing near-term supply chain disruptions. Now, measures backed by billions of dollars include rebuilding production and innovation capabilities. So that's the US dedicating funding, at least 50 billion pounds of funding for semiconductors, a semiconductor and R&D. Establishing new supply chain resilience program to monitor, analyze and forecast supply. They're intending to support the development of markets that invest in workers and value sustainability and drive quality. They intend to leverage the government's, uh, US government's role as a purchaser and investor of critical goods. And they intend, importantly for us, to work with allies and partners to, to decrease vulnerabilities and, and in the global supply chain uh, market. Now, given that we're in a similar position to the US, it won't be surprising to hear that we're adopting a common approach one aimed at reducing the impact of disruption. And I just wanted to touch briefly on three areas of focus for the MOD right now, resilience, agility, and visibility. Now on resilience, um, which is a measure in the supply chain uh, on its capacity uh, to respond to a shock and then return to a steady state situation. That's how we define it. We've assimilated the lessons from COVID. Indeed, we are hoovering up those lessons now um, from the Ukraine crisis, where those early indicators and warnings of global supply chain disruptions were there for us to see, provided you knew where to look and how to interpret the probable implications. Now, Lord Harris talks to uh, the, um, the epicenter of the COVID pandemic, of course, being WOTAN, uh, and the indicators and warnings that our purchase orders in defence were going unfulfilled were there for us to see, but we didn't have the understanding and the visibility then. We're starting to address that. We start to collect and process data um, on our understanding of the global supply chain networks. We also celebrate the work of the logistic delivery partner in defense, Team Lidos, um, who provide our outsourced fulfillment operation. For that operation, which has been in, in extent uh, um, and delivering for the last seven years for defense, withstood the global shocks of COVID well, and Lidos scale up and absorb the uh, increase in volume and complexity that hit us then and is so now. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. On agility, which is the ability to sense and respond quickly to, to a disruption to reduce the negative impact it has on the supply chain. We now have the right MOD governance in place in the form of a supply chain resilience steering group. It's a three-star level co-chaired uh, entity um, and it's chaired by DG Commercial and my boss, the Chief of Defence Logistics and Support. 
Now, work is underway on a supply chain substrategy for defence, which I'm leading, the first in over 10 years. And at its core will be three key headmarks. The first of those requires a change in our mindset, and that is to recognise that supply chain resilience is born from a continuous decision, sorry, a conscious decision on where we wish to provide effect between three competing facets of what I call the supply chain triangle. And they pull in different directions, these three points of the triangle. And it's a choice between cost, performance, and resilience. And what we must do going forward, consider the trade-offs required to achieve the right balance for defense. The second headmark strategy that I'm working on is to adopt a bimodal supply chain. And by that, I mean, mode one is what we've all come to understand in global supply chain terms, a just-in-time approach where markets are predictable and lead times are stable, and we weigh on quality and cost alone. I'm proposing a mode two, however, which is about adaptation and responding quickly to global shock when it manifests. And it requires us to apply choices to de-risk likely downstream impact. And those include onshoring, nearshoring, friend shoring or ally shoring, which is that link back to the US's uh, DOD public action plan or indeed MOD provided supply chain interventions. And then the third and final mark is to achieve greater degrees of integration and collaboration across our end-to-end -end supply chain enterprise. For we have become too fragmented in the pursuit of cost efficiency over effectiveness and resilience in the last 10 or so years. And finally, and briefly, visibility. And this is about um, striving and driving to increase visibility across our supply chains. And the ambition requires transparent, accurate, timely, and complete plans and events, including data, to support effective decision-making across supply chain operations. Now we've recognized we've got more to do when it comes to mapping our global supply chain dependencies. And we have therefore, through a series of pilots, started to map our critical platforms and systems, in some cases down to tier 11. And we've done that for type 26 as an example. We're then intending to take a commercially available product um, with, will ingest a lot of open source data and information, uh, as well as uh, our own internal source data. And through a process of advanced machine learning, we intend to uh, build a visible real-time understanding of our supply chain networks and dependencies. And importantly, the platform will procure, allow us to measure relative resilience and, and in due course, should we do scenario modeling where we can move a weak link in a supply chain somewhere else and see what the corresponding outcome for better resilience would be. Now, armed with that evidence, we expect to be able to take that to the new governance we've created. And we're expecting to be able to make agile decisions um, along the lines of the choice vectors that I've spoken to. And so finally, in conclusion, if I was to reflect on the question, how prepared were we over the last two years? The answer most certainly is not well enough. Um, and it has been driving the outcomes that I've spoken to today. Now there's more I could have covered around relationships and readiness, but time precludes. So I hope that was informative, uh, ready for questions. Thank you very much, Simon. We'll, uh, we're going to take the questions at the end and also looking at the time because I do want to, uh, given that people will be going afternoon, get us through to 1500. Um, I'm going to yeah, thank you very much for that and giving your perspective then. It's interesting in the chat box, um, Lord Harris has come up and talked about some of the, some, some of the other inter interactions beyond uh, what you've been doing from your own, own perspective there uh, in strategic command. But we talked earlier on about the linkages um, across public and private sector. So without further ado, uh, I think I shall uh, cut across now to our next um, speaker, who is Mr. Hugh Jenkins, Chief Operating Officer um, of our sponsor, LADOS, the Chief Operating Officer for Logistics, uh, Commodities and Service Transformation. Um, and therefore, very much a person who is looking at resilient supply chains. So, uh, Hugh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. Can you hear me OK? I can. Thank you. Great. Thanks for everything. Well, first of all, City Forum uh, and, and guests, thanks for inviting me and uh, really, really pleased to be part of this uh, this fascinating 
uh, conversation. Keith, if you can start to put the slides up, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so I'm the Chief Operating Officer for uh, Lidos, running the LCST programme. Uh, it's a £6.5 billion 13-year programme. Um, what do we do? Well, we procure, we store and we distribute commodities for the armed forces right across the, the globe. Um, it's a fascinating programme to be involved in. Uh, but my background is, is uh, retail logistics. I've worked for companies such as Asda Walmart, uh, DHL, where I ran various uh, uh, retail contracts, and Poundland. Um, so coming into defence uh, two and a half years ago, I was pretty, uh, pretty green. But you can imagine the two and a half years we've had, what a um, steep and fulfilling learning curve I I've been on. Uh, first slide, please, Keith. So Lidos has produced a thought leadership uh, paper examining lessons learned during COVID-19 pandemic and discussing how supply chains could become more flexible, building in resilient but adaptable systems and processes as an integral part of their logistics operations. This paper has been produced in, been produced in partnership with Cranfield School of Management and the co-author is the acclaimed logistics expert, Professor Richard Wilding OB, who's a non-exec director of Lidos. And I'm going to share a little bit of his thoughts and some of our experiences. I'm going to talk about the lessons learned um, from COVID. I'm going to talk about the digital transformation that we have undertaken on behalf of the MOD and continue to do so. Uh, I'll touch on the concept of bimodal that Simon talks about, and, uh, and I think that'll be a common thread to the, to the conversation we're going to have today. Uh, I want to talk about the hidden threats, um, so not so, so a challenge to the assumptions perhaps around where threats come to resilience. Um, I'm going to touch on embracing the future technologies uh, that give us greater resilience, and I'll finish with a little bit of our what we do in this space. Next slide, please. I think I'll start by saying uh, Lidos' involvement in COVID-19 was truly humbling. To, to play our part in the national effort and, and to see uh, our teams respond uh, was, was absolutely remarkable. I've picked on a few bullet points. So I'm just going to go through them for you. Our first learning was about adapting to the MOD immediate requirement. So the, with, I can remember the date uh, in, in, in March uh, 20, uh, 2020 um, when uh, the world changed, really. And we would get requirements from the MOD that would change by the week, the day, and even the hour. And our ability to react, to set up new operations within hours sometimes, to procure new, new products from all over the world when the supply chain was closing down, uh, to establish new communication channels, establish relationships at pace, was, was really rewarding and was fundamental to the success uh, of the part that we played in the response to the pandemic. Intense focus on value for money was important. Um, our programme, the heart of our programme is about delivering better performance uh, for the end for the end consumer, for the soldier in the field. But also it's about delivering hundreds of millions of pounds worth of benefits uh, for the MOD. And whilst a lot of us would observe profiteering at this stage, we were at the other end of that scale. When you talk about bimodal, um, it's really important that the response to this new normal, this, this constant change, this constant challenge, it's really important that we protect the business as usual. And whenever a, a crisis emerges, it can be quite an adrenaline rush, an exciting time for people to get involved in. So therefore the demarcation between those that are going to address what's needed right here, right now with a crisis versus those that are uh, 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 responsible for protecting the day job is really key. We have to motivate those people to continue to keep the engine running. Who would have thought that the COVID pandemic, which gave us a fantastic um, test uh, to surge our response for increased volume uh, for the MOD, would be used today, right here, right now, in our response to the, to the Ukraine challenge. Um, the agile customer engagement, responding quickly to the way the MOD established themselves, established communication channels. It was remarkable and humbling to watch under uh, Simon's leadership, actually, the operating cells that were established really quickly and how we interlocked with those was really key to effective communication. Our IS platform, which I'll touch on shortly, um, was tested. We had to cope with product coming in that was completely uncodified. Product was coming in from all over the world, ventilators, uh, PPE equipment, some of it um, absolutely essential some, essential, some of it no good at all. But we responded really positively by interjecting it into our IS uh, system and being able to flow through those goods through wherever they were needed. And collaboration was key, both with MOD and other industry partners. Next slide, please. We have undertaken 30 years of IS legacy change in 30 months, and we continue to do so. Our supply chain integration portal delivers a business as usual mode that's intended to meet steady, predictable demand, with the emphasis being on efficiency, 
leanness and low cost and focusing on risk mitigation and prevention. But secondly, there's an agile mode where the emphasis on speed, responsiveness and flexibility, focusing on the agile development of strategies to deal with the unexpected. It's a journey, not an end state, and we continue to develop that. Next slide, please. Simon talked about bimodal, and I think uh, Ed's comment around the, um, the vaccine task force was a real evidence of that bimodal. People being focused on a particular activity that was outside of the norm. To bring this to life though, um, Simon has uh, established a strat-based contingency fund, which allows us to allow Simon to provide funding really quickly without any commercial conversation at all in a, in a safe framework with an established industry partner, which allows us and has allowed us uh, to exploit that opportunity by releasing funds to, in the response to the, the current uh, conflict in Ukraine. We've done that right now, right here, very, very quickly. It was very effective. Next slide, please. In terms of, uh, conventionally, we think of supply chain resilience and risk in terms of high profile, high impact, low probability events, tsunamis, earthquakes, we've touched on some of those today, hurricanes and major infrastructure failures. In reality though, supply chain risk is more invidious, involving a combination of some factors that are external to the organization and some that are internal. We need to keep challenging our understanding to make sure we never become complacent around where those threats could come from. Next slide, please. And in terms of future technologies, many of you on the call will be familiar with these, whether it be blockchain, artificial intelligence and machine learning or additive manufacturing, where could soldiers in the field 3D print uh, um, commodities, uh, which would absolutely support the resilient provision uh, of, of necessity, nece necessity uh, uh, products in the field, where supply chains into those dangerous areas is really, really difficult. We're seeing that reality uh, emerge now and we continue to do so. Next slide, please. LIDOS growing ability to manage large and complex projects in challenging environments demands that resilience is at the heart of every uh, uh, customer solution that we develop. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Back to you, Ed. Thank you very much there, Hugh. And it's great to get the, uh, you know, the not, not just, if you like, the view from the other side, but I thought what you brought out there really well was you know, the linkages that you, that, that you have formed and how you viewed it uh, you know, fr from the other side. So that wasn't uh, the view from the other camp to the MOD. It was, it was the view of someone who has uh, worked, uh, worked on that border. Sorry, I was having a few technical problems here at this end, but I think I've got the... <laughs> Fully functioning Wi-Fi back up and uh, back up and running. So you, thank you, um, thank you very much indeed. Um, looking at time, forgive me if I move us on um, quite quickly, but um, I now uh, just want to invite our last panelist, which is uh, Mark Rowley. You all know Mark, and you've read read the bio, but um, I will just mention to Chief Constable of Surrey. But then, and I've already trailed him to an extent, uh, absolute uh, leading light in counter-terrorism policing for which he was knighted uh, and worked with him and then and he did an outstanding job. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks, it was great to see you. Um, so, so flipping really from the technical and the logistic to the much more the human and society. So um, society's grievances and which are obviously contributing at the moment to more bodily resilience. Um, I'm going to come at this from my personal journey. So having spent sort of um, several years wrestling with counter-terrorism at a sort of national level during the rise of ISIS and then later in my time, the sort of emergence of, sort of serious right-wing terrorist threats as well. As I, as I left um, and I had a moment to reflect um, and I was invited to do a speech, um, Colin Crampall Memorial Lecture, and my reflection as I left was that we were sort of missing the point in as much as um, countries that have had difficult terrorism problems over many years, like Britain, like the US, like Israel, build fantastic counter-terrorism capabilities that are never perfect, but are, um, are very impressive. Um, however, what I was seeing was more and more people coming through and the number of operations growing. And what I realized was underneath that, was what I would call the extremism problem. Um, and those countries have robust, may have robust counter-terrorism infrastructures, but those countries, and particularly Britain, have no 
counter-extremism infrastructure to speak of. And that problem has sort of um, concerned me in my sort of um, four years out of policing. Um, and I've done various work with think tanks on it. And I spent sort of over a year with Dame Sarah Khan at the Counter Extremism Commission doing some work on the, some work on the subject. So as I sort of tried to dive into this problem um, and looked at it, so of course extremism feeds on grievance and hence the link to this, this, this title. Um, what I saw uh, was, particularly in the research with the Counter Extremism Commission, some quite startling social um, changes in sort of social trends. And, probably the, and if I'll, I'll put in the shortcut, the report that we issued a year ago, Operating with Impunity was the title. Um, the statistic of all the ones we pulled from various sources that really startled me. In the UK, um, those in the brackets um, uh, 16 to 24, when surveyed, one in six of them did not believe the official accounts of the Holocaust. That absolutely scared the bejeebas out of me, that you would have one in six not believing the official accounts of the Holocaust. The reason, the sad reason that I think anti-Semitism is a canary in the coal mine is sadly for Jewish communities, pretty much every extremist persuasion, extreme right, extreme left and Islamist um, in the Venn diagram of who they hate, sadly, Jewish communities are there for all of those groups. And so I think that statistic is particularly powerful. And that says something about how Western societies are developing. The second point I'd make about that cohort of people, uh, 16 to 24 year olds, is that this is the group who three or four years ago, past the point where the majority of them now get the vast majority of their news and information from non-conventional media sources, I sort of social media, et cetera, rather than the conventional sort of broadcasters, printed press and the sort of, and, and that world that has um, more attention to accuracy than the online world does. It's not perfect as we know, but it certainly has more attention to, more attention to accuracy. So with, with um, Dame Sarah Calm, uh, she asked me to look at, with her, sort of the legislation around these issues. And what struck me is the technological and social changes of the last 10 or 15 years, the law has not moved with them. And this isn't a point for me about narrow technical definitions. It's more about the consequences of a whole new factor in social interaction and public debate uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of the way that the way that the way that takes place and what it seems to me has happened is that we have um, we have we now have sort of um, social media that magnifies grievance, as we all uh, as we all know, and probably many of us have watched film, the, the, the documentary, The Social Network, is a very good illustration of that. But there's many papers on why, if you mark, if you commercialize and monetize attention, then the way the human reacts is the more extreme content gets more attention. Um, but what we haven't realized is that the laws we created to guard against um, the creation of hatred and creation of tension between communities, where of course there are very fine issues of freedom of speech. Those laws were created in the analog world. Certainly in the UK, they range from public order acts in the 1980s through to various um, updates and tweaks that were done largely in the noughties. So any cracks in that legislation can now be magnified and exploited in a completely different context of the online space. And what this allows people to do is to pick on grievance and um, twist it and turn it into uh, drawing people towards um, toxic ideologies. So that is a free running machinery that we have yet to, got to get to grips with. Um, 
and I've been struck with some people starting to use the analogy of, of that world almost being like the modern day um, tobacco company, uh, tobacco and cigarette companies of the 1950s and 60s, emerging evidence of social harm, but a business model that's not yet prepared and able to confront that. This is now overlain with the information wars and several of the previous speakers, um, uh, Toby Ned in particular, have touched on um, I know the full spectrum ideal, idea, the sort of grey zone threats, as, as very much being playing out in the sort of background to the um, Russo-Ukraine um, war. And so we've now got state factors playing into these dimensions as well and, and trying to meddle in elections and preying on grievances. So what does, what does this mean for solutions and um, the future? So I, I've got four, um, four buckets here, really. So there's, there's, there's one about laws. I don't think laws is the only answer, but our laws on acceptable behaviour have not really caught up with the online space and need to do so. Um, countries are starting to roll the sleeves up and try and regulate in this space. Um, uh, Germany have done some done some some targeted interventions. Australia have. The British government is looking at a very um, ambitious um, bill called the Online Safety Bill. Um, but there are some there are some cracks to be uh, there, there are some cracks to be closed down, which people I think are afraid of tackling because of um, because of freedom of speech concerns. But I do think, and our paper illustrates how those are. You can deal with both of those issues. I think some of this is about the regulation, the, the legal aspect is regulation of, of, of companies and, and, and how they act online and what they permit. Um, I would make a comparison with the anti-money laundering um, provisions that we now have widely accepted across the financial sector. If you went back to the 1980s, there was an argument going on, which was governments and law enforcement targets starting to say, we need to expect finance institutions to make reasonable efforts to spot dirty money and finance institutions saying, we just transmit money across the world, we can't tell dirty money from clean money. Um, and that debate is now very different and finance institutions accept responsibility and work very hard on it and sometimes mess up, but work very hard on that issue. We're on that journey with the technology sector. So I think there's something about laws, whether it's about individual behavior, it's about technology environment. Secondly, um, I think there's something about incentivizing new business models I think some really interesting things going on in pockets of the world, looking at different social media models that are built on encouraging agreements, um, uh, built on different approaches to how you um, bring people together in the technology space. Um, thirdly, I think there's something about education and how people understand information, how people operate online. We haven't, we haven't thought hard enough about the world young people go into now and their ability to process a much more complex information world than sort of um, old bored people like me had to. And actually seeing their way through that is an educational challenge. And then lastly, I think there's a challenge here in terms of social policy. Um, Dame Louise Casey, uh, we known to many of you, did an outstanding report about five, six years ago on integration and opportunity, which very much explored the issues of um, complex communities, grievance, um, integration, and other challenges in communities. Um, sadly, her report hasn't been acted upon, because it's, it's very tricky social policy issues. Interestingly, at the start of her report, she articulated, I think, six reports since the year 2000, that various um, prime ministers and governments of various hues in the UK had commissioned on and around this subject, and they all came to similar conclusions, and. Uh, no sort of no government sort of left of centre or right of centre in the UK has managed to roll its feet up and act on them because they're quite challenging. So step back from this, the grievance culture is driving extremism and all sorts of other social problems. It's stretching our ability to, um, to sustain a sort of safe and secure and confident sort of society from a social perspective. But unless we unless we're prepared to wrestle with the complexity of new laws how we target business models, how we educate young people, 
and how we approach social policy that reduces the risk of grievance, then I fear this is going to keep snowballing. Edward, thank you. Mark, thank you very much. You finished there with several challenges, uh, sev several challenges for us, um, and you also raised the uh, the uh, as I think everybody has one way or another, you know the the the, the subject of the of of the digital age, which I'm sure will come up in Q and A uh, uh, in a minute, and indeed uh, I think what we're all gravitated to one way or another, which is which is the culture. Do we have a culture? that looks at these questions of, of, of national resilience, or have we rather lost our, our, our way uh, in thinking about how times could be quite tough? I know you haven't because you spent your time dealing with some of the tougher elements of society. Um, talking of which, and I think I do now have to say that um, that was the bit that's off the record, but now we're moving to the second session where um, answers are now going to be off the record. But uh, we're going to be teed up with a few introduction remarks of a great friend of uh, City Forum, um, Steve Elliott, who the direct segue uh, from Mark is she was the um, chair of the College of uh, Policing, but now she's the chair of the Health and Care Professionals Council, but she has a background, if you read a bio, in all sorts of tech and innovation, which also segues from some of the things that Mark spoke about. So, um, Christine, just before I hand you uh, uh, the floor, could I just ask everybody to... Um, start pasting your questions in the chat and I'm starting to compile those questions at the moment. I'll put them uh, to the panelists once uh, Christine has given us her opening remarks. Christine, the, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Air Marshal. Um, and really what I want to do is, is to highlight three themes that have been pulled out by the speakers thus far uh, and to say that for each of those uh, talks, I'm sure we could have a complete webinar in itself because they've been absolutely riveting. The first is Mark, having said, raised a question about the world we've prepared for young people. The second one is, as Toby said, the norms of society unraveled during the pandemic. Um, and the third thing is, in various ways, everybody has referenced the need to collaborate, to pull together certain groups. And so, to summarise the few remarks that I'm about to make, I'd like to advocate for the UK having a Ministry of the Future to pull all of that together, a new ministry. And if you want more on that, there is a compelling, scary, but also hopeful, full of solutions book by Kim Stanley Robinson of the same title. So everyone's talked about the unprecedented disruption. I'm not going to go there, except that what I would say is the most dramatic of these is probably the least attended to, and that is the eight year window to tackle climate change mitigation and repair. It's been talked about, but climate change is not like the pandemic that we haven't yet had, it's not an if, it's a now and it's a when. Three degrees global warming spells disaster for half of humanity. Failing to regard climate change as a serious problem is what one renowned thinker describes as a death warrant to the species. So the security and resilience challenges discussed today will be as almost nothing as our economic and social structures, the old order is swept away. Reference the IPCC's new report, which is owned by government. And the forces of oppo opposition, and believe me, I'm a person who has their feet very much on the ground, but climate change action is opposed by carbon connected industries in a broad based, highly organized, coalition and managed with extensive lobbying. I know I'm wearing a green jacket, but I regard myself as very much a humanist. The IPCC has mapped out a path for us to halve emissions, practical actions, the reports full of them, and get to net zero by 2050. The principal tools are investing a few percent of GDP and some legislation and a huge amount of work. But the pandemic gives hope too. It's shown how widespread change can be achieved at pace, including reducing carbon emissions. 
So the massive lifestyle changes and rebalancing required to tackle climate change hold the key to unlock unprecedented fortune for those, and I hope this will include the UK, on the winning side of history, a scenario from which developing economies also have much to gain. In the US, more than half the population is now millennial or younger. COVID-19 has most negatively affected their economic prospects, and older millennials also bear the brunt of the 2007-9 Great Recession. Their channel of their energies into holding themselves and others accountable. Fewer than half see business as a force for good. Climate change and protecting the environment is a top concern of theirs, and as consumers they put their wallet where their values are, stopping or initiating relationships based on how companies treat the environment. So yes, supply change, and yes, food sustainability, but to have food sustainability, we need sustainable food. And that means that we need a more plant-based diet, of course, and it, it's really not as bad as people think. So these generations, millennial, Gen Z, tend to be rather appalled by the behavior and procrastination that they perceive in older generations. So my final point to you all, after this very interesting set of openings is, where are they in our audience? They must be brought into the room. They must be brought into this room, don't you think? Because they and their voice are crucial to resilience, challenges and the future. Thank you. We are in two parts here today. You can ask questions at any time by uh, plopping your question into the chat box. Uh, Rachel, myself, uh, and City Forum staff will see that. Uh, please don't take offense if we don't get exactly, or if we paraphrase your question um, for uh, time's sake here. Uh, as an audience uh, member here, um, you can ask questions at any time, so uh, please do so. Um, during the second session, as Mark said, um, that is uh, off the record Chatham House rule. Um, and please um, be as candid as uh, you would like. Um, our distinguished speakers today are a, a real um, starring showcase. Uh, and I'm, I've been happy for the small part that I've had in, in bringing them together to talk about uh, making Western countries match fit. Um, almost every single person that I, I spoke to in preparation for this uh, asked the same question, fit to what? Uh, and our panelists today uh, will be speaking to some of those issues and expounding on issues uh, should you have been a uh, member of part one. Um, today, our keynote will be get, uh, given by uh, Kirsten Todd uh, from uh, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, CISA. Um, this is um, uh, one of the newest agencies in the United States government and uh, whose uh, responsibilities uh, in the areas of resilience for critical infrastructure is not to be uh, underestimated. Um, we've got Dr. Pil uh, Dr. Uh, Kilworth back for a repeat engagement talking about science and technology ever the forefront uh, on everybody's mind. What, what is science and technology doing for us? What is it not? Uh, Elizabeth Bra, from a uh, senior fellow from the American Enterprise Institute, will be speaking to citizens, government, and resilient societies. Um, it's hard to separate government and the private sector and our society when it have a when we have a expanded discussion about resilience. Uh, Julia Ebner will be talking about uh, grievance uh, societies and how we solve the problem of grievance. Uh, we. You certainly on the part one heard uh, from uh, Sir Mark Rowley about how uh, grievance can be amplified by social media. I expect that probably some of those topics may come up again. Uh, and then uh, we'll be going to Air Marshal Ian Gale uh, talking about rethinking what makes countries match fit a view from the military. Uh, and then I will be, uh, before we go into uh, part two of today, I will be reaching out to the good friend of City Forum, Baroness Neville-Jones, to help me with her very um, 
sync thoughts about what we've heard. So without further ado, could I hand it over to Kirsten? Kirsten. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, thanks to all of you for the opportunity to be back here again. Um, these events, City Forum events, are always such a uh, valuable opportunity to connect with great minds and join these conversations around tackling the cyber and the physical infrastructure. But, you know, Mike, even in just what you uh, offered, when we look at some of the the emotionally intelligent issues around grievance, around how empathy is playing in our global world, public sentiment. Uh, I will get to that a little bit because I think as we look at this current conflict with Russia, Ukraine uh, and this unjust invasion, we're really seeing how public sentiment globally is having such an impact on policy and how critical this has been uh, for the, the, the conflict itself, but then also how we're mobilizing countries around the world as well as industry. As we all know right now, amidst this geopolitical landscape today, uh, the cybersecurity threats to our global infrastructure are at the highest level in history. And people often ask why that is. And I think it just becomes one of these issues around technology growing exponentially, uh, the interdependencies growing exponentially, and the threat surface increasing tremendously. Uh, and certainly with the pandemic, that threat surface uh, and people working from home around the world, that threat surface increased even more. Now, this urgency really supercharges an already uh, incredibly challenging environment in which cyber vulnerabilities continue to be one of the biggest strategic threats, not only to the United States, but across the globe. It really is the primary national security threat that we're facing in the U.S. And given this, given this involving threat environment, we know that we need to take bold action to transform the cybersecurity posture, which really forces us to look at today, but then in the future. And so in the United States, as Mike mentioned, uh, I work at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, which is a component of the Department of Homeland Security. And CISA is the youngest federal agency. We're only three years old. Uh, and we are the lead federal agency for protecting U.S. critical infrastructure for defending government networks. And so while CIS is focused on the security of the nation's infrastructure, we know that cybersecurity is inherently an international mission. We don't get to block cybersecurity by geographic boundaries. It is much more interdependent. And so our nations working together across borders to share information, to set norms, to set standards, uh, to share information about threats emanating from nation states is critical. And so today I just wanna to take a moment to share some updates on how we're responding to this current threat landscape, as well as to highlight examples of how we're working the broader international community. And first I'll just share that when we think about, when I think about CISA, I think about it in three buckets as far as what we're focused on. We're very much focused on building out the cyber workforce for ourselves internally, but then also setting a model and a standard for how we do this globally. And what I mean by that is we've got to be looking more broadly at what it means to build this workforce to create resilience today and in the future. And we have um, several efforts focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And the reason as we look at all of this, it's about creating a more inclusive workforce where when we look at problems, when we look at challenges, we're looking to innovation. And innovation means a inter an interdisciplinary approach to cybersecurity. It means being able to bring in and engage individuals with expertise in psychology, sociology, history, economics, not just math, science, and engineering, which of, of course are critical, but really looking at that innovative approach. Uh, we're also responsible for securing the federal government networks. There are over, well, there are, there are 101 federal agencies. And so that obviously there's tremendous variability from the Mammal Mission Commission to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So we're, we have a huge range. And then it's working with industry. It's working with the private sector. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And so as we look at what we're doing in response to the threats uh, emerging from Russia and Ukraine, we've obviously been tracking this changing environment closely. Uh, two weeks ago, President Biden warned that there's now evolving intelligence that Russia may be exploring options for potential cyber attacks uh, to the United States. But what we've certainly seen, and we have to be quite aware of people often asking the United States, you know, are we surprised that Russia hasn't used cyber, that we haven't seen a cyber attack? We say that from a Western nation. If you are in Ukraine, you are very much uh, being attacked from a cyber perspective. We've seen the saturation 
of Russia cyber attacks to Ukraine significant, being significant. And so as we're looking at protecting the world, um, we're both looking at how do we help Ukraine and how do we create resilience around the world. And CISA has said consistently over the past several months that organizations large and small remain at risk. And we have to be prepared to protect and defend our assets. And so last year, we really accelerated our work uh, when we saw Putin escalate his aggression ahead of this invasion. And we launched an outreach campaign to warn industry about the potential for cyber threats, urging all organizations to have what we're calling Shields Up. This is a campaign that we instituted uh, and it's on our, our website. To, and it, what it does is it offers the latest technical product security guidance. Uh, we recognize that many critical infrastructure operators and owners, state and local governments can find it challenging to identify resources. So we've established a catalog of free resources. Uh, the point being that as we're looking at this, you know, we were early on, we said there was no credible threat. Now we're saying there's evolving intelligence. The point is we have to be more resilient, not just as a nation, but as a world, as we're looking to respond to this conflict. And our engagement with stakeholders and uh, infrastructure uh, has been critical to that. And it's sharing of information based on what we know. And so what we often hear is frustration. You know, we'd like to see what IP addresses you're seeing. And sometimes it's not even that we that that information exists. It's much more that we know that this is a tool that's used by Russia. We know it's being used against Ukraine. And we also know that you don't as an entity, whether it's a country, whether it's a business, need to be the primary target. But what we've seen with Russian attacks, such as NotPetya, is that there are secondary impacts that are cascading that even Russia doesn't always anticipate. And NotPetya, uh, some of Russia's companies and oligarchs were actually impacted, uh, 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 not on purpose. And so this, we can see that there's the opportunity for some of those cascading impacts. And so as we've looked at this effort, we've asked you know critical infrastructure owners and operators to continue to do the basics. I mean, one of the questions that we get asked a lot about this Shields Up campaign, which is about lowering the threshold for reporting, having incident response in place, making sure you've got continuity of operations in place. People say, and companies are saying, how do we maintain? We're starting to see some vigilance fatigue. But in fact, if you really look at the details of Shields Up, it's a lot of the same efforts and ideas that we've been talking to businesses about for a while that they should be doing. So it's going to be a very interesting evolution as we go through this conflict because we are in a marathon right now. We just don't know what mile. And this is not going to be something that ends, you know, by the end of April. Uh, in all likelihood, we are going to be really at an uptick of resilience and vigilance. And how can companies, how can state and local governments, how can countries manage that threat over the long term? And I think that's one of, you know, certainly that's one of the things that we're thinking about at CISA is how do we help and support that resilience, not just for today, but for tomorrow. I think, you know, as we see uh, one of the opportunities that has come from this conflict is that businesses do have a heightened security posture. And I was talking recently with a CIO of a large pharmaceutical company who said, you know, we're never going to go back to the way it was. Uh, and I don't, other than the fact that conflict, you know, is, is the driver for this, if we can raise that bar for security across industry and government as a result of this for cyber hygiene, updating software, multi-factor authentication, encrypting data, all of these elements, if they become more integrated into the cultures of companies as well as state and local governments, then we will put ourselves at a heightened security posture. And, you know, part of what we're doing with the Shields Up campaign and looking at this is working with stakeholders, working with CEOs to really get at the key issues. Um, you know, we're really encouraging organizations to report cyber incidents. And I think this becomes, if we can get into the habit of being able to do this, not just for today, but in the future, where we are able to then take the data. Sometimes it's very much about creating the constellation from a bunch of data points. Uh, we may not see it in one or two data points, but as we look together, we have to exchange this information to be able to create a broader picture, which really goes to operational collaboration. Now more than ever, the engagement with industry and government is so critical. Uh, we know certainly from the government perspective and as we look to the future that no one entity can protect itself on its own, that the only way we create a secure uh, ecosystem is by working together. And we say that in government um, in order to defeat one of us, you have to defeat all of us, in the words of Chris Inglis, uh, and that cyber is a team sport. And this really cuts across, you know, peacetime and conflict.
because we've got to look at how we work together. So back in August, uh, the uh, CISA established the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, which as somebody who's worked in industry, worked in this space for a really long time, you know, this term public-private partnership had become so hackneyed, something that just really lost its meaning because it wasn't offering anything to either party. But what we established through the JCDC in this operational collaboration is real-time information sharing, which we really first put into play with a Log4j uh, event back in December, although we had had a couple of examples early on where we were able to identify a threat, share that with the JCDC, the companies in the JCDC, and one of those companies took that information and applied its resources, uh, both human and otherwise, and was able to build out a report on the threat that was then public. And so that type of partnership is so important. And as we're looking at Russia, Ukraine, uh, we are seeing that real-time information exchange to help get a broader perspective of the landscape, the threat landscape. Landscape. Uh, with Log4j, we actually established a Slack channel, which is a communications channel where the operators from the JCDC companies can just put in information about what they're seeing with ransomware, with DDoS, and we can start, start to see if there are patterns. Those companies can start to see if there are patterns. And I think having worked in this for so long, being able to see this operation work and being able to see this engagement um, is really a, quite an achievement. There's always more to do, um, but it's so important that we develop these partnerships um, and that our partners lay out this operational collaboration uh, as we look to do this. Because one of the other pieces to this as we're looking to prepare is how do we prepare for what we know could really take us down? So what is that cross-sector industry exercising, et cetera, that we can focus on. And that's something that the JCDC has been extremely helpful. When we look at this globally, building, sustaining, and advancing international partnerships are so important to CIS's missions. We've uh, cultivated international support for our objectives. We're bolstering this operational capacity. And when it comes to shaping the policy en environment, uh, we are working across the globe to be able to build this out. And we're regularly communicating and coordinating on cyber and critical infrastructure topics with our Five Eyes partner, partners. And notably in December, we published the first ever of a Five Eyes jointly sealed cybersecurity advisory on mitigating Log4j. And as we're looking, you know, joint sealed products, both we think about it in, internally to the interagency in the United States, but we're appreciating and recognizing that the more that we can do that internationally, the better we will be. CISA currently hosts a liaison officer from the UK here deployed in the United States, and we have one now in the UK. Um, and as we look at our partnership with the UK, uh, it remains obviously one of our closest allies, as Sir Winston Churchill often referred to this partnership as a special relationship. As we work side by side, the sharing of information, not just with industry government, not just with the interagency, but with our partners is so critical. Um, CISA recently in February joined efforts with the NCSC and the Australian and Cybersecurity Center to release a joint advisory highlighting how trends over the past year have shown an increased globalized threat of ransomware. And I can walk through other examples, but it has become so critical that we share information over, across the globe. That's how we will see the true constellations of the threat, and importantly, the constellations of solutions, of innovative approaches, how we can work together. So CIS is working with our international partners to bolster the defense and the resilience across our infrastructure across our state and local governments across the countries, which in turn really fosters a safer physical and cyber a physical cybersecurity ecosystem for everyone. Our resilience in the present for the future and the future mandates the pre-event planning, operational collaboration, and partnership globally. And I know in the Q&A, we'll have some time to talk through the conflict. I think there are some very important lessons that we're already seeing in cybersecurity and resilience as a result of this conflict and how it is truly different. Uh, but one of certainly the primary takeaways just in cybersecurity, but in protecting the world, is the value of international partnerships and the importance of building resilience around the world. Thank you for your time today. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A and certainly looking forward to hearing from my esteemed fellow panelists. Thanks, Mike. There we go, talking to the mute button. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for um, a very fast paced and information filled <laughs> uh, opening keynote. Um, I, I picked up some, uh, some reoccurring themes that we'll address here at the end, uh, but without, uh, Delay. I'd like to move to um, Dr. Paul Kilworth here so we can talk 
uh, to the science and technology aspects of, of this. Uh, Paul, can I go to you now? Many thanks. And an excellent uh, keynote there. Um, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about exploiting science and technology from my national security perspective. Um, I should start off by saying that when I think about science, it's not just academics, and universities, it's a broad field. It's all the different types of companies involved in research and development, it's think tanks, civil servants, that broad community taking forward uh, uh, the future horizon in technology. So um, I'll tackle the question through, through three prisms. I'll have a look at the shifting context we're operating against, how we link our missions to s and um, and how we protect our science and technology base. So starting off with that shift in context, if we go back to the UK Integrated Review last year, it recognised that the world is, is changing. We've had decades of UK and allied science and technology advantage. That is now coming under threat. Uh, the Integrated Review recognised if we don't act now, we may not lead the world in the next generation of emerging technologies. Why does that matter? Um, Previous national security reviews had often focused on science and technology as a provider of capabilities, the brilliant equipment, kit, digital tools that our warfighters, intelligence officers and others needed for that critical operational edge. Um, and that's true. But science and technology is not just about capabilities. Um, previous last few reviews have stressed it's linked to the economy. Science and technology is what delivers economic success and selfishly the tax base that pays my salary um, um, as uh, on which everything else the government does depends. If you look at the economic hubs around our great universities in the UK and the US, that shows the impact that science and technology has to our fundamental prosperity. Um, but the Integrative view, Review also stressed that our science and technology power is critical to the rules-based order. Um, technology underpins all our lives, and the rules that set that technology are set by organisations, networks, countries, which really understand science and technology and can influence those international debates. So science and technology matters more than ever to the way we each live our lives um, uh, daily um, around the country. So um, the integrated view set out that the UK to be, remain a great science power required us to act now to invest in science and technology at a very different scale, to work differently, and to take more policy risk to keep us there. So how do we focus our missions on science and technology? How do we link national security to that wider community? Um, I'll, I'll touch on three areas, which I think are at work both at the operational level, but also strategically. Um, so the first challenge is how do we define the problems that matter? Um, look across the audience, a virtual audience on this call, all our organizations, we're an incredibly creative um, extended community. There are no shortage of good ideas at any level, and certainly not in this virtual room. The challenge is prioritizing them, which ones really matter? when we talk to industry um, and talk to academia, they're always very clear that they would love to help us more if we could be clear about the problem book. What matters most to us? What do we really want to focus on? Um, and that's often not just a capability, it's not just the things they might build or research, but it's the wider policy challenges. It's the way we need markets to operate, the social issues we want to address. Um, cybersecurity is a really good example. The questions of, and pro defining the problems isn't just another piece of um, digital equipment to help protect a network. It's how you deal with problems like ransomware, how you deal with hostile states. It's the broader picture. Um, I think all of us have been working across the community on how to better communicate our key challenges and how we listen to novel views from partners. But at the national level, the new office for s and strategy here in the UK, which answers to Patrick Valance and the PM, have been helping to define that better for the UK. Um, and I'm conscious that the international level will be making breakthroughs. When I look at AUKUS, for me, that's a brilliant example of a shared generational s and challenge being defined and prioritised between our three countries in a really novel way. And I leave some of the audience to the question of, can we imagine more allied problem books in s and joint definitions of challenges and priorities? Um, second theme I'll pull out is how do we develop solutions um, with academia and industry? Um, we know that simply working within government, within the barbed wire of a traditional national security community is limiting. We can't get the right ideas in, the right skills, the right, the right connectivity. Um, and I think uh, all the um, countries represented in this conversation have been experimenting with new ways of taking that forwards. In the UK, the National Security Strategic Investment Fund, NSIF, has been looking at ways for government to invest in dual-use technologies, cutting-edge approaches which bring together um, the market and national security. 
co-creation centers for Rensticks have been, uh, have been taken forwards, bringing together small companies with the national security community. And I'm really proud of some of the works going on around leveling up around culture and diversity inclusion, finding ways to reach out to more of the country and the nation, which traditionally we haven't touched. Um, and if I was looking internationally, I'm really interested in how we might build stronger um, allied national security academic R&D programmes. How do we bring together some of those really leading voices in each of our communities um, to tackle those difficult questions and develop solutions together? Um, then the third strand of um, this, this bit for me is uh, de delivering solutions. Um, it's really hard, we know, to pull through um, new science and technology solutions within organisations. It's challenging, it's really hard. Uh, bureaucracy gets in the way, policies, things get stuck. Um, one of the solutions we're seeing, uh, I think, in all our all our allied nations, is the importance of digital platforms to enabling that. Um, if we have modern digital platforms, cloud-based technologies, we can develop the solutions uh, with re the research community with S and T, and then pull it in seamlessly you know, onto our own systems uh, in a much more a much frictionless way. And um, I think all our nations are investing in this. But it's also critical to understand what the international friction points and challenges are, what makes it difficult for organisations to work together, where, where the blockers, where, where, where can we change policy in various ways, which might make it easier for our leading thinkers to work and collaborate more closely on those common challenges. Um, and then third and finally, I'll turn to the challenge of protecting our science and technology. Um, this is all about the threat. Uh, and I think most of us uh, who've been in our careers for any length of time were probably brought up in a period when we saw science the safe international space. It was an area of collaboration. It was an, area of, uh, uh, um, an open area, which was often free from wider conflict. Um, that's really no longer the case. We all see um, hostile state actors targeting our academic institutions, whether it be cyber, as we've been discussing a moment ago, or by human intelligence, and not playing by the same set of rules that we've traditionally um, grown to understand in open societies such as the West. There's a real threat both to our researchers, the product of their innovation, um, and to that cycle of national security and prosperity advantage. Um, it's not a simple problem, though. We can't simply pull up the drawbridge. Um, Academics and um, researchers and technologists need to collaborate internationally. Um, it's at the heart of what the scientific endeavour is. Um, the UK and our partners are all working on solutions, helping institutions to protect themselves, to better understand the risks and threats, better cyber security, better human security. Now, that's in many ways often a new paradigm for many academics, particularly those who have not traditionally been involved in building capabilities for us. Many of them were worked with us before. The national security space is not one they're familiar with. But it's also a new area for national security. It requires us to be much more open to explain more of the threat to those less familiar and for many of our teams to understand the work of academics more accurately. It's no use us giving advice which simply can't be applied in academia or research and development um, more widely. So to sum up, um, for me, we must recognise that our traditional strength in science and technology is a true national asset. It was created for us by previous generations, and it's one where we've enjoyed a wonderful edge over the course of our careers. But science and technology is also something that needs to be constantly reinvented, developed, and protected with allies if we're to remain secure and prosperous. I think how we do that is something we might pick up on in the Q&A session. Many thanks for listening to me today. Paul, well, thanks. Um, it's going to take a while for me to, to unpack what's implied there. You, you specified a lot. Um, but there are the implications of what you stated in your, your three priorities um, are not inconsequential. So uh, thank you for that. I, in interest of time, I'll move right to uh, Ms. Elizabeth Bra from, uh, from the American Enterprise Institute. She'll talk about citizens, governments, and resilient societies. Elizabeth. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I'm advertising the NATO Defense College today. and. Uh, if you, hear, if you hear an echo, it's because they have nice big rooms here um, and the sun is shining. So uh, um, uh, greetings from Rome. Um, so it, what, what I think strikes, uh, should strike everybody when we think about the, the new national security challenges facing our countries is how much of those uh, threats and how much of that aggression is directed towards civil society. And we as ordinary civilians have had the incredible luxury of not having to worry about national security uh, for uh, at least 30 years, and in many cases more than 30 years. Um, 
and the, that luxury I uh, I posit is coming to an end uh, for us ordinary civilians and for companies. And so, if we look at what's happening, is uh, there is a uh, uh, Kirsten and, and also Paul uh, have gone through the cyber aggression that's taking place, and that's uh, that is clearly something that targets civil society as well as. Um, as uh, traditional uh, military, uh, uh, the traditional military uh, installations, but then uh, the other, and and I should say the 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 gray zone below the threshold of Article Five um, armed violence is is constantly evolving. So I just mentioned a few things, but of course uh, it, we'll see more more forms of aggression added as our adversaries come up with them. Uh, but uh, disinformation is, of course, another area that has been uh, extremely busy in recent years, but also um, in, in uh, something that's growing quickly is um, uh, business, subversive business practices. Um, Paul has talked a little bit about uh, how, how it relates to uh, science and technology innovation, but subversive business practices uh, go much farther than that, or rather uh, the... the uh, the stealing or acquisition of uh, of key expertise is only part of it. So um, we are free and open societies. We like investment. FDI it does fantastic things for our countries. But what if that FDI and takes our best companies away from us, our most innovative companies, not necessarily our biggest companies, but our most innovative companies, the ones with the most uh, most cutting edge ideas. And that is where we are today when it comes to, to our private sectors that have done so brilliantly thanks to international investment. They, um, they are often uh, in the sites or in the, uh, uh, they are often targets of um, of interest for, say, Chinese companies in, especially in the ten areas where China is trying to turbocharge its economy to become the world's leading high tech manufacturing economy. That those are ten pillars that are part of Made in China 2025. What is the best way of turbo <coughs> of turbocharging your economy in the areas? Uh, uh, where you seek to overtake the West, it's to buy up the best Western companies. Then you get you you uh, you speed up the development quite a bit, and uh, you do so operating to the uh, according to the rules of, of the globalized economy because we can invest where we like, we can buy companies where we like. And by the way, those companies can be mature companies that are already uh, operating uh, commercially. It can also be startups that are still in the in the VC stage. Uh, but all of them are open to investment. In fact, they need investment. And that's also how we as, as free and open societies uh, need them to operate because our governments don't have the money to invest in every single company. So we need that international investment. But um, as a result of, of uh, our dependence on international investment, many of our best companies have been lost to us. And I'll just give a couple of examples also to illustrate how difficult it is to, to tell friend from foe and to, to, to tell when, when investments are, are legitimate and when they should um, cause red flags to go up or warning bells to go off. So in 2016, a Chinese company uh, bought a German um, industrial robot maker called KUKA and it looked like just any old uh, acquisition and uh, it, it went ahead. And a couple of years later, it turned out that KUKA was now a company focused, and this is a cutting edge company. It was now a company focused on the Chinese market and the CEO had been replaced. And it was essentially a company that was lost to Germany. Then uh, earlier this year, it came out that an Italian uh, a high technology aviation uh, company called Alpi Aviation. Aviation had been bought a couple of years ago by a company based in Hong Kong. And uh, it went through the government approval process because it was a, a, it's a dual news company, uh, but the, the approval process was, didn't flag anything up. Then Italian financial police, which is extremely skilled, thought they should take a look at it. And they found uh, through 18 layers of ownership, they discovered that the ultimate beneficial owner is now a Chinese uh, state owned entity, uh, but the company is gone. It's, uh, it is now a, a company servicing the Chinese market. So what do we do about that? And uh, this is where uh, 
we, I think, as, as Western societies, even though we can't tell companies and, and citizens what to do, we will need uh, or we have to ask citizens and companies to, to do their part as corporate citizens and as individual citizens, because it's in everybody's interest that we maintain our fantastic technological and business advantage, uh, just as it is in our interest that we keep disinformation at bay so that we don't disintegrate into boring factions within our societies because we can't agree on what constitutes a fact, uh, constitutes the fact, and just as we need to keep uh, cyber attacks uh, uh, at least uh, down to relatively, uh, uh, down to a manageable level so that uh, our, our critical systems can keep operating, which is why um, uh, I'm so impressed by, by what Kirsten and her colleagues are doing. Um, so how do we do that without becoming an authoritarian, becoming authoritarian countries where governments tell uh, companies what to do, tell citizens what to do? I, I think uh, we have to start with education. So business leaders, those in charge today, have spent their whole careers in, in a very luxurious post-Cold War environment where they're only their only task was to make money for their uh, for their shareholders um, it's they are not they are not ignorant they they are noticing that something is changing and a, an interesting indicator of that was um, uh, a new risk survey released by by the, one of the uh, large insurance companies uh, operating out of London um, released a couple of weeks ago that found that 95% of companies are now concerned about the risk of doing business in Asia Pacific, which of course means China, and that's up from 63% uh, just two years ago. And in Europe, the risk is uh, that. 55%, I think, are concerned about the risk of doing business. By the way, Europe, including Russia, um, uh, and in the Middle East, it was something like 58%. So Asia Pacific really stands out. And why does it stand out? It's because another, uh, as a result of another form of, of um, uh, aggression towards our societies, and that is the, the coercion of globally operating companies uh, that are increasingly being targeted by China, but now also uh, by Russia as easy proxies for their home government. So if, say, the government of Lithuania, the government of Sweden, the government of Australia, the government of Taiwan says or does something that doesn't please China, uh, a company or a sector, or indeed the whole private sector from those uh, countries will be targeted by, um, by China, which is exactly what's happened. So the first part is education. Um, business leaders are aware of what's happening in their sectors to their companies, but if we as Western societies um, were to provide them with regular uh, strategic updates, <coughs> not commercially sensitive updates, clearly, because then there would be a commercial disadvantage to those who are not invited, but uh, strategic updates about, uh, about geopolitical risks, then they would be able to make uh, wise decisions about whom to do business with, where to do business, so as to minimize their exposure to risk. Also, and this is my last point, Mike, I see you're getting, uh, you're getting nervous about the time. Uh, the, uh, the same thing goes for ordinary citizens. Four years ago, Sweden, uh, the, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency released a fantastic leaflet called If Crisis of War Comes. And, and internationally, it earned uh, the, the, the Civil Contingencies Agency a lot of chuckles because people said, people thought, well, you know, there's no war crisis coming, what are you talking about? Um, uh, but then came COVID and people realized there can be crises uh, short of war that can bring societies to a halt. And if we are not prepared for them uh, as societies, people will panic and it will cause even more harm than, than, than the crisis alone. So uh, educating the public without causing alarm is, I think, key. And it's, uh, it's not very difficult to prove to to put together a leaflet and say these are the these are sort of um, crises that could come your way. Here's how to prepare. And yes, people might be a little bit um, concerned upon what, upon receiving them in their in their post box, they, box, but they won't be as concerned as they will be if a crisis strikes and they are completely unprepared, which is uh, the the point where most Western countries are today. Uh, over to you, Mike. Elizabeth, thanks uh, once again a lot to to unpack and and I I would say points well made. We talk a lot about cyber literacy, uh, but do we ever talk about resilience liter 
literacy? Do we really have a high literacy as in the general public and then quite frankly in our governments about uh, what it means to be resilient? So thank you very much. Um, I'll move right on to uh, uh, Julia. Julia, uh, take it away. Yes, hello and good afternoon, or I should say good morning to everyone uh, from, from here from London. I'm speaking from London at the moment. Uh, I will talk a bit more about um, actually the threat that we're facing and, and that we see emerging from non-state actors. But of course, this is also very closely linked to state actors then amplifying and exploiting the grievances that have emerged within civil society. Uh, I want to first highlight a recent study that some of you might have come across, published by Robert Pape and his research team at the University of Chicago, that found that 90% of the people charged with illegally entering the U.S. Capitol grounds on 6th of January last year had no obvious affiliation to right-wing extremist or militia movements. And this really reflects what I've been observing in my research as well. I spent some time analyzing the closed chat rooms that right-wing extremists used in the weeks leading up to the capital storming. And you can see that they explicitly wanted to exploit the uh, election fraud narrative, for example, in order to get to new audiences and to really mainstream their radical ideologies, uh, which are demo uh, anti-democratic and often pro-violence. This is, of course, not a new tactic. We want to hit the average. We want to hit normal people. The American neo-Nazi and the founder of the Daily Stormer, Andrew Anglin, already wrote in 2017 in the lead up to the Charlottesville rally. I was uh, back then I was observing kind of the run up to the Charlottesville rally from inside the, organize, the organizers chat rooms where they were really talking about uh, their ideas of how they could make their own movement seem more legitimate to a wider public and how, could, how they could really weaponize grievances such as grievances around Southern heritage in the US or also more widely around freedom of speech. So this is, this is a dynamic that has really turned into a trend. And of course, um, QAnon is really a success story of precisely this tactic. I first joined QAnon undercover in 2017, when it was still a tiny fringe movement, maybe a few, a few uh, thousand, I think around 7,000 people were in the chat rooms when I joined them. And but of course, we see moves spend on a global level, millions of followers and hundreds of millions of people who are exposed to some of their campaigns or some of their um, social media posts and their conspiracy myths. And it's been really shocking to see this growth uh, over the last few years. So I've, I've asked myself repeatedly in my research, what are the underlying grievances that white nationalists, QAnon and other conspiracy move, theory, theory movements and also other extremist networks uh, can tap into and use to their advantage? What I found based on my undercover investigations and on my analytical research at the ISD in London um, was that it gets really dangerous when radical groups, or when radical group narratives, I should say, meet personal grievances. And this is um, this has been really uh, the, the key theme, of course, that, uh, that has emerged as the, the, the key threat since the outbreak of this pandemic, that we have witnessed how COVID-related grievances such as loneliness, uncertainty, and especially frustration with government policies and what some of the extremists call the global elites, were weaponized by extremist groups and conspiracy myth networks and transformed into hatred against minorities, the media, scientific institutions, and democracy itself. And we've seen, of course, state actors and especially state-sponsored media outlets such as RT and Sputnik, in particular Kremlin-backed um, outlets, really amplify these narratives and these uh, fundamentally um, destructive conspiracy myths and divisive uh, rhetoric. Today, we're increasingly seeing the emergence of loose global networks of extremists that curate their own content. So I would even say that the next trend is that we have as many extremist ideologies as we have extremists, because uh, basically everyone becomes their own curator of content. And although the lowest common denominator is always an anti-elite and anti-minority rhetoric that is rooted in grievances, extremists increasingly hold hybrid forms of radical ideologies. 
So my takeaway from this is that conventional approaches to tackle and counter extremism and disrupt terrorist groups are doomed to fail with these post-organizational and cross-ideological networks. So what does that mean in practice? We need to start with their lowest common denominator, which is grievances. Um, so I think the first point here is that we need to spot and address, address grievances before extremists do so. So in light of the COVID pandemic, this might mean very, very specifically to identify population segments um, that have been disproportionately impacted by the adverse uh, economic and psychological side effects of the crisis and really proactively reaching out to those and, and offering them alternative solutions. We also need to tackle the exploitation of, of grievances by algorithms. I imagine that this was already talked about in the previous panel, but really force big tech platforms to stop the amplification and the prioritization of, of uh, emotions such as outrage or, or anger and to counter extremist grooming also on the more hidden old tech platforms. There is a whole alternative uh, tech universe that we've seen emerge since takedowns have been happening on, on the bigger social media platforms. And unfortunately, these, these content takedowns have been a bit of a cat and mouse game because extremists constantly find new ways of circumventing platform policies. And of course, they have created their own uh, platforms. And this is also where we need to um, do some do some work and where I see a lot of potential. So especially what can we do when it's too late, when grievances have already been used by extremists to bring in new members from outside into their extreme networks. We should adopt uh, better or, and develop better grievance detectors and linguistic markers that could help us find those people at risk of violent extremist activities. A lot of work has, has gone into that. And I recently conducted a linguistic analysis of terrorist manifestos that hasn't been published yet, but uh, where I looked at terrorist manifestos since Anders Breivik, and I, I found that kinship language applied to the in-group or to other members of the in-group in combination with the idea of an existential threat from outside to the in-group is a key marker and a key pattern that can be found in all, um, uh, in all manifestos of, of, of terrorists who then went on to commit an act of violence. So we should also, uh, that's my last point, develop grievance interventions online and apply some of our lessons learned from offline de-radicalization models that were successful to the darker corners of the internet. Not just tackle the bigger um, social media platforms, but really go into some of the hidden darker corners on the internet, um, some of the alternative YouTube or, or Twitter um, uh, platforms. And at ISD, we've tested a few of these approaches, one-on-one -on -one mentoring programs that can take place online. And um, I will leave it here, but I would uh, love to, to also um, yeah, discuss this further in the, in the panel discussion. Thank you. Julie, I'm sure there'll be uh, a lot of questions in, in this area. It's, it's top of list for, for many people. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move uh, directly to Air Marshal Ian Gale. Ian? Thank you, Mike. And uh, you asked at the start uh, what, what uh, or how we interpreted match fit. So I'll give you a go. Uh, it's to compete and win. And by winning, I mean secure advantage, certainly from, uh, from my perspective anyway. Um, I'll obviously give you a UK view and I'll try and just focus on what we're doing rather than uh, what we might do. And we can discuss that later on. So my organisation is involved in tightening the circle between uh, what's happening at the front line, and that might be in war fighting or grey zone activities, experimenting, evolving, trying out, exercising new techniques with uh, allies and partners, feeding that through and pulling that through into our doctrine, which is our 101 of how we do things, looking out to the deep futures, uh, out to the mid 2030s and work out what, they, what that means for how things might be in a period beyond the initial frenzy of where we are now. And then finally, plowing that back in through education and training throughout um, uh, officer education and non-commissioned education through every career stage, including the, the hallmark courses of our advanced and higher command staff colleges, the uh, Royal College of Defence Studies, Defence Cyber Academy. So those are the sorts of things I'm involved in. I'm going to talk really on three topics, integration, thinking and technology. Uh, 
And integration is this massive word that's easy to say and difficult to do. So I, I just want to go from inside the organization to out, if you like. We start with integration uh, with a, a, another name for combined arms operation. All of those involved working better together, understanding each other, planning together, executing together. Um, it's doing the basics well, which is a bit of a theme, actually. Um, and those basics these days, of course, include what some people call the new domains of space and cyber. I don't see them that way. But then I come from the air environment where it's taken about 100 years to sort of integrate air power into operations. So doing the basics well, making sure we're covering the different domains and making sure we're taking care of things like uh, information, which has its own characterization, but we don't call it necessarily domain at the moment. That really we ought to be doing, but is a very, very hard thing to do and easy to say and, and requires an awful lot of effort. But here's where it gets better and harder. If we want to do more with this, we need to be cross-government because when we want to operate in the grey zone, and let's, uh, let's look at this through the current conflict in Ukraine, Ukraine is fighting an existential war having been invaded. Everybody else who's involved in that is fighting a high intensity grey zone operation. It's only Ukraine that is fighting toe to toe with the Russians. So if we're going to be successful in the grey zone, which includes lethal activity, we need to be better integrated across our governments. And in my experience, the bigger the country, the harder that is. So the bigger the country, the more mass and money you can bring to a problem but the harder it is to integrate because the more incentives are there to, to draw stovepipes. And then, uh, and, and by the way, uh, I think we've got some good examples in authoritarian countries of integrating across government well, and it does seem to be the way to get grand strategy done. Uh, I don't think we want to organize in the way that authoritarian countries do though. Uh, and then finally on this, allies and partners. Um, it will be obvious that some of the big structures are really, really important, like NATO. Uh, AUKUS is a new and uh, edgy new partnership that should help us out. And the GEF, and I noticed Martin in questions was asking about the Baltic states. The GEF is a very exciting one to the UK because it's 10 nations, eight of whom are in NATO, but it's organised in a way that it operates below the threshold of Article 5, so in the grey zone. And it's an opt-in, not a consensus. So we can get on and do things with that. Uh, on thinking, I've already mentioned the, um, the work that the uh, Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre do. We're, we're looking at a future operating concept to add to the um, operating concepts that we have at the moment. We're looking at command and control in the information age. We're looking at audience centricity as a way of getting our messages across. We're looking at what information advantage means and obviously learning from, from current events as much as anything else. Um, but a lot of this thinking, actually, it's about thinking about thinking. We do a lot of work on our, our people as they go through to turn them into critical thinkers, to, to really look at what the question is actually asking, to question the premise that, that made the question up in the first place, and to think outside of um, necessarily quite conventional boundaries that militaries quite often end up in. Uh, and I come back to doing the basics well in our thinking. I mean, I, I really enjoyed Kirsten's uh, Shields Up because we're using an awful lot of that ourselves. A lot of this, if we just took care of the basics, we become very difficult targets. And I speak as somebody who runs the organisation that over the last year has been dealing with the aftermath of a fairly... Um, advanced and sophisticated ransomware attempt in my, in my organization. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, technology and I don't want to go into too much depth. We, we are doing things as you'd expect with artificial intelligence, with digital twins. But I think what technology is bringing the ability for us to do is to be faster, to bring a variety of people, techniques and solutions into the uh, equation, to have a higher quality of uh, choices to pick from. And actually part of the technology is to communicate all of that and join it up effectively. Because even in the modern age, and, and again, you can, you can see it in the open source of what's going on in Ukraine, all organizations suffer with the ability to pick up a communications device, 
and talk quickly and securely and share data with their friends and partners, even though they might not be cleared to the same level. There we go, back to you, Mike. Ian, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, once again, a lot of implications in, in what you're talking about here and, and not the least of which is doing the basics well, which, which is much harder than it implies. If it was the basics, then you, people equate the basics with being something being simple. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth when you're saddled with legacy technology that you're either flying through the air or you're running a power plant with. Uh, it, it is uh, challenging, uh, especially with technology debt and legacy technology to, uh, to make those things work. Um, at this point, uh, what I'd like to do is reach out to our great friend of City Forum, uh, the Baroness Neville Jones, and I'd like her to give us uh, four to five minutes of her thoughts on these topics and uh, what has resonated with her, uh, with the speakers. Um, Pauline, can I turn it over to you, please? You're on mute. Sorry, I am. No, I'm not. I'm, I've just come off mute. Well, I think I've been given a big challenge. Very interesting uh, uh, set of, of uh, presentations. Um, I suppose I, uh, with the, the, the sort of subtitle of our, of our session today, which is Making Countries Match Fit, uh, it's not only a question of what fit means. Increasingly, I think it's also what match are we in? Um, I do think that uh that the the challenge that's posed in in europe uh by the russian invasion um does change the game a bit uh kirsten said you know the the biggest threat that we face in the us is the cyber threat i think that's probably still true in europe but there's a danger of something you know much more much more red hot i think we can't exclude uh, the danger of, of real combat. Um, I think a lot hangs on what happens in, obviously happens, happens in Ukraine, uh, but unless uh, Russia is defeated, and that's going to be a pretty hard task, but unless they're defeated, we, I think we are going to see a country where they are uh, encamped, there, is, there will be no peace settlement on that basis, uh, and we will face a running, a running insurgency and a danger of, 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 of overspill conflict. So I think the, I think the, um, the odds have gone up uh, a very great deal. And we are now in, you know, in a potentially very dangerous uh, situation. Um, having said that, um, I think it's probably not the discussion of today, but I think we need to bear in mind that, that the gear that we will be in you know, may, may be much tighter and uh, much more threatening. Uh, than even the one that is increasingly, I think, uh, a challenge to us uh, as we are now. Um, on the on the on the cyber side, um, in some ways, I think I am less uh, less concerned about our ability to cope with that than um, than I than than perhaps I, I have been. I think we do understand the extent to which we need to make it a whole of society effort. Um, governments still need to lead, but increasingly it's a partnership with the private sector. Um, the private sector increasingly, and this is where a new side comes in, of course, the, the private sector, which is on the whole, the generation of the technology. There was a time in the past when governments generated technology. These days, private sector generates technology and government uses it. Um, but the private sector increasingly needs protection against the threat of uh, intellectual property theft. theft. Um, and that is actually really, I think, a really big challenge uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is how do you trade if you are actually going to you know, put a very tight ring around your, around your technology? We have to balance, therefore, you know, how we protect with the need to continue to trade. I do not think that a world where we have you know, uh, self um, closed systems is going to be a safe world. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a question of, of, of being able to do both, but on the basis of what I think will have to be new rules, and they will be new rules which uh, do restrict uh, 
the sale, the investment, the cooperation you know, at both uh, educational but also at commercial levels of uh, sensitive technologies, which we have to define. Uh, and then we have to stick to the rules, which means we've got to do it you know, as allies. Um, are we in the uh, frame of mind that uh, will bring that about? It seems to me that on the whole, at the moment, when we look around the world, we are, as we move into new, a, a new technology and a new technological world, we are busy competing with each other. Now, that's very healthy and very normal. Uh, and certainly one doesn't want to abolish competition. But increasingly, of course, if you look back at the Cold War, uh, we collaborated and we cooperated um, you know, against a common threat. How do we combine our ability to move forward on technology, uh, which will involve competition, trade, and at the same time collaborate in the protection of those technologies? I think that's, a, that's quite a big, big challenge. And it's not surprising, I suppose, you know, that new formations are emerging, they're like, like AUKUS and, uh, and some others. And I think we will need more of them. But we need to get our minds around the notion that we have got to work with each other, I think, more than we, we do at the moment. We're working in the national context, but uh, we need to do it more on, a, on an allied basis. And we need to share. We will have to, I think, you know, go down the road of sharing some of these uh, technologies. On... Um, the, the threats to us. Uh, one of the things that I think rather striking about what Julia said was that the Russians are very good, are very good at this game of using uh, things like um, information, uh, 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 AI, you know, to open up conflict. It's, it's something they specialize in. So it's not simply a question of how we deal with you know, some of the divisions that have opened up in democracy. It's how we also um, deal, with, with, deal with the magnified threat that, that we face from those who are using um, the weapons of, of division and, and conflict, um, social conflict, you know, to, to weaken our societies. So we have to respond to that uh, at another level. And here I think that um, we've been quite neglectful, it seems to me, of the, the way in which our democracies function. Um, we've allowed we've allowed um, no behaviors of a kind which undermine trust uh, on our in our internal institutions, um, and there is a there is a quite a big uh, um, job it seems to me of re-establishing inside our societies uh, a level of trust uh, and and um, cooperation and respect for our institutions. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, we can, uh, it is entirely up to us, because uh, I think unless we do it, uh, the attack on our institutions and the way in which we can uh, be divided um, is only going to increase. We, I don't at the moment see us as being on a, on a good uh, 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 track. Um, finally, what um, Elizabeth was saying about... Um, uh, no, the the need. Uh, I mean, to protect our protect our our assets. Uh, I think that's uh, that, that's very important. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's a it's a it's it it requires a it requires a different mindset from the one we have at the moment. Um, so we need, it seems to me, to do, to to elevate uh, the whole question of of how we handle science and technology uh, in our societies and the importance we give it. Um, it's, you can see in national contexts, uh, the UK's integrated strategy, the way in which you know, technology has been elevated in the, in the, uh, in the national agenda. Uh, but it seems to me that we need to translate these, these uh, national perceptions into something which is um, much more, much more international in in the democratic world, uh, and we need to have a much more comprehensive strategy of what we actually count as being really important to us, and how we seek to both protect and promote it. Thank you. Uh, so, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, close this session. 
I'd like to thank everybody here, all the speakers for your very candid uh, comments. Um, I'd like to thank uh, BAE Systems, uh, Lidos and uh, Shervine and our partners at City Forum, Chartered Institute of Information Security and Team Defense Information. And of course, last but certainly not least, all the hardworking City Forum staff that work to make all of this and our little bugs at the last second work uh, on our behalf. Thank you to everyone. Have a great day.